horrific things happen in the world we live in. We would like to believe only evil people carry out atrocities. But tyrannies are created by ordinary people, like you and me. I'd never been to the former Yugoslavia before in my life. So what actually struck me about the country was how beautiful it was, how nice people were, and yet how ghastly they could behave. Psychology can help us understand how such ghastly behaviour can occur. You're going to see famous psychological experiments and a few new ones. Our guinea pigs are ordinary British people. You'll see how willing we are to obey. I was wondering if it would be possible to have your seat. Yeah, is that OK? Yeah? Thanks a lot. And how readily we play the bad Samaritan. We would even electrocute a stranger. 315 volts, the answer is ink. Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. Seemingly simple responses add up to a recipe for tyranny. This started as a student role play. Well, now you boys got to come to some kind of decision here. Initially, I had created an interesting social psychological experiment. But within five days, what I had created was an evil, tyrannical regime. I'm going to take you on a journey which I know will shock you. It has me. We're going to see how each and every one of us is capable of doing terrible things to other people, even when we're sure we couldn't. And in the right, or should I say the wrong circumstances, we can create our very own tyranny anywhere. And it's possible in five easy steps. From childhood on, we create out-groups as opposed to our own in-group. We class certain others as underdogs. This can result in prejudice. And this is our step one. It's easy to create superior in-groups and inferior out-groups. Once group differences are established, in the wrong circumstances, a leader can exploit them for their own ends. Teacher Jane Elliott began her crusade to demonstrate the irrational nature of prejudice 30 years ago in Iowa, USA. The morning after Martin Luther King Jr. was killed, I was teaching third grade in all-white, all-Christian Riceville, Iowa. There were no people of color in that town. Most of my children, in fact, all of my children, had never been in the presence of a person of color. And I didn't know how I could explain that death to my third grade students. You think you know how I would feel yeah. to be judged by the color of your skin? I don't, do you think you do? No, I don't think you'd know how that felt unless you had been through it, would you? No. I decided that the next morning I would do what we do in my society. I would pick out a group of people on the basis of a physical characteristic over which they have absolutely no control. It might be interesting to judge people today by the color of their eyes. Would you like to try this? Yeah. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? I mean, the blue-eyed people are the better people in this room. Uh -oh. oh, yes, they are. Mm -hmm. yeah. Blue-eyed people are smarter than brown-eyed people. Uh -huh. Well, the brown-eyed people have to stay in. Mm -hmm. The brown-eyed people do not get to use the drinking fountain. You have to use the paper cups. You brown-eyed people are not to play with the blue-eyed people on the playground because you are not as good as blue-eyed people. The reaction from the students was immediate and intense. Brown-eyed people were immediately angry, confused, shocked, saddened, withdrawn, and blue-eyed people were immediately delighted, arrogant, superior, condescending, vicious little third graders, and they had been excellent friends, absolutely fast friends the previous day. What happened, John? Russell called me names and I hit him. Hit him in the gut. What did he call you? 
brown eyes. Well, he did it. What's wrong with being called brown eyes? It means that we're stupid or well, not that. Yeah. Oh, that's mm -hmm. just the same yeah. way as other people call uh, black people mm -hmm. niggers. I was utterly astounded at how quickly my third graders knew how to play the game. What are you crying about? Sorry. What are you crying about? My feelings were hurt. More than 30 years on, the exercise provokes the same passions, even in Should adults. Should I feel sorry for her? I don't expect you to. Should I feel sorry for her? We live in a society in which people are allowed to treat those who are different in an ugly way because of their differentness. I cannot shed tears for a young white female in this exercise who knows that this is an exercise, who knows that it's temporary, who knows that she's getting a college credit, one hour of credit for being here. What her study shows is a way in which tyrannical leaders can create artificial differences between people and then superimpose on those minimal differences um, values of inferiority and superiority, dominance and powerlessness. And then we are on the path to tyranny. In spring 1999, one man waged war on his own personal outgroups. And it happened on our own doorstep. David Copeland bombed black and Asian communities, then targeted the heart of the gay community in London's Soho. There was a bang and there's smoke and there's people just crawling out. People, the people that are crawling out, they're getting help, you know? Because they can't walk. It's loud, you can hear it a mile away. Just that boom. <laughs> Three people died. More than 70 were horribly wounded. Today, the Admiral Duncan pub is fully restored, but other wounds are harder to heal within the gay community. People come in either to target the area because they know it's gay and gay-friendly, or because they're ignorant and they presume they can take their prejudices and their homophobia wherever they are, and especially if they're a little drunk, it'll come out all the more easily. Discrimination doesn't have to be obvious, which is probably better if it's obvious. It can be hidden, it can, that's the worst part. Um, it can be little things of everyday life that pile up, and then you know that you have to behave a certain way. The experience of the Soho bomb illustrates another level at which this ordinary group categorization uh, can escalate to. It goes beyond simply saying, our group is heterosexual, they're homosexuals, uh, we think our way of life is better than their way of life, to saying that we reject what that group stands for, we reject their very identity, it's a threat to our way of life, and we want to eliminate them. Prejudice is completely irrational, it's in its nature that it's irrational. We do still have whole groups of people who are excluded and who can be regarded as out groups. Large numbers of homeless people, people begging on the streets, disabled people, people with mental illness, people with physical disabilities suffer terrible discrimination. And if in your mind you decide that certain groups of people are excluded from the dignity and respect and humanity that everybody else enjoys, then you don't afford them the same rights as other people. We all harbour prejudices. Unknowingly, we may each be taking the first step to tyranny every day. From early childhood, we learn to obey, to do the right thing. We assume it's for our own safety and the well-being of society at large. Even so, we'd like to believe that we wouldn't obey just any order. Do you always do what you're asked? No. Do you always do as you're asked? Mm, not always. Not always. Do you always do what you're told? No. Do you always obey orders? No. A famous psychologist of the 1960s, Stanley Milgram, 
conducted a simple yet revealing experiment which demonstrates how wrong these people are. We often do obey with little questioning. We set out to repeat Milgram's experiment using secret cameras. Hi there, sir. Hi, how are you doing? I was wondering if it would be possible to have your seat. Why? Um, please, would you mind? Would that be okay? Why do you want to? Um, would you, not, would you not want to give me a seat? You need it, yeah. Have you got bad legs? Um, no, not really. Thank you very much. Very kind of you. Okay. Um, just wondering if I could possibly have your seat, if that's okay. Have my seat? Yeah, is that okay? Why do you want mine when there's all the others? I'm just, I'm just really wondering if, if you'd give me your seat. Did you not want to know? If you don't mind, if you need my seat, I should sit. Thanks, so that's very kind of you. Great. Right. It's evident that every society needs the majority of people to follow the rules, to be compliant, to be obedient, to respect authority. I mean, that's the glue that holds all of these individuals together. The problem is, where are the boundaries to that obedience? Hi, how are you doing? I was just wondering if it would be possible to have your seat. Yeah, is that okay? Yeah? Thanks a lot. Out of the 30 people we approached, an astonishing 50% gave up their seats despite challenging the oddness of the request. We then added an authority figure into the mix. Hi there, how are you doing? I'm um, just wondering if I could have your seat, if that's okay. Thank you very much, it's very kind of you. I'm sorry, just pull up. Okay, great. Right. Right. Thank you. When you add an authority element, when there was a person in a uniform, that obedience, that uh, clicking, that click were automatic responding went up to 100%. Every person that was asked complied. Um, is it possible to have your seat? Yeah, no problem. Yeah? Great. Thank you. Half of us have a tendency to act without thinking. And that's where we begin to have tyrannical danger, that when people can be made to act,